Hello and welcome. My name is Miles. I love to draw and paint. You can see some of my work here and here and here. Somehow I've ended up doing what I did as a kid in my adult life. I go to my room, I draw, and somehow life continues. Recently I just wanted to make some videos to kind of show what goes into making something like this. So I've recorded all the footage behind this recent drawing. It's like 40 hours of footage and I've tried to edit it down to something digestible. It's not quite a tutorial. I wanted to flip between talking about little specific technical things and then really big picture stuff about managing your motivation and inspiration as an artist. And art has added so much joy and meaning to my life. And if this can give you even a tiny bit of motivation to go out there and find that thing in your life, then that feels like it will have been worth the effort. Yeah, hope you enjoy it. Let's get on with it. So beginnings, how do we start? I like to start with something called a thumbnail sketch. A thumbnail sketch is a small, compact, simplified drawing where you plan the whole composition and don't get caught up in any of the technical problems. Once we have a thumbnail sketch, we've taken that overwhelming infinity of a blank canvas and we've given it some direction. We've given ourselves something to aim at. And now we just need to break that down into manageable chunks. So piece by piece, we can move towards the final image. So here's my thumbnail for this image. The next step was to shoot some reference and do another sketch of the same image, a little bit larger, closer to the final size, which you're gonna see now. Here I'm again still drawing very loosely. I'm trying not to get too caught up in worrying about making this look like a finished image, but I'm investing enough effort that it's gonna be more useful for when I start the actual drawing. This is helping me further develop a vision of the composition. So I, I have to try hard enough that I can start to get a sense of how it's gonna look without you know, wasting my own time making something that ultimately no one's really gonna see. Now for this image, I feel kind of confident to start after just this sketch, but for some of my drawings, I'll have to go away and you know, plan a whole perspective grid. I mean, the amount of prep work varies based on the image, right? Whatever the image is really about, what I want people to see or take away from the image, I want a, I want a good idea of how I'm gonna handle that. Okay, stop the video. It's me from the future. I'm watching the first draft. And it's just occurred to me, I forgot to talk about like the most important thing about thumbnailing and this thumbnail, which is like what I've actually drawn. That is the key decision we're making here. So I figured the easiest way to let you in a little bit on my thought process when I'm thumbnailing is to talk about some small changes I could make to this image and then have you imagine how they would change the storytelling. So notice how it's like all the same face in the water. It's the same person. Imagine if it were lots of different faces of clearly different people and how would that change your read of the image? Or notice that she's kind of sat down with her leg in the stream. What if she were reaching in with her arm? How would that change the perceived action of her and her relationship to the scene? You know, she's in a kind of arboreal forest scene. It's lush that carries a one kind of vibe with it. What if all the plants were withered or it were winter? Like, what does that carry? And at all stages, this is what making images is. I don't tend to think in terms of an explicit story, but these relationships between different elements in the picture, they all interact with each other and force your imagination to try to project meaning onto it. And the fun part for me when thumbnailing is just intuitively sketching and playing around with the way these different elements interact until I find something that it just feels like it has some kind of inherent meaning I find interesting, but ideally I don't even know exactly what that is. There's just an intuitive sense that there's something worth exploring. Yeah, some of my best ideas have happened on days where I felt like I had nothing to say, I didn't feel like drawing, and I just sat down and tried sketching. Yeah, it comes out of a process of being playful and just exploring ways you can change what you've put down, combining different sketches from your sketchbooks. It's a process that happens over many days of making sketching just part of your routine as an artist. And once you've had that happen once, you've had a good idea come to you on a totally normal day in a normal moment where you didn't expect it, 
it completely changes your perspective on the idea of inspiration. It's no longer something you wait around for, but it's something you have to make happen through action. Okay, let's get back to the video. You can go back to me from three weeks ago. All right, it's a different day. Time has passed, I'm still alive, which means I must continue with the drawing. So you'll notice as I start the drawing phase, uh, I start with a lot of big, simple, sweeping lines. That's because I always try to work in a method where I fully expect I'm gonna fuck things up because you know, we're, we're human, we make mistakes. What is more annoying than drawing the figure perfectly or drawing the face perfectly and then realizing the head's in the wrong place, right? I might have a line for where the top point on her knee comes. And that line, if I realize I've made the legs too wide or too narrow or something, I can fix that in one second. If I've invested all that time in starting with a beautiful try-hard contour and then I realize it's not in proportion or it's placed badly on the page, all of that time is now wasted. So anytime you put in effort, you're making a bet on all of that time about the accuracy of the drawing. And if it's wrong, you have two choices, which is either all of that time didn't progress you any further, any closer to being done, or you just have to live with it not being how you want it to be. But I've always slowly introduced more information only when I have increasing certainty in the underlying general statements of where I'm gonna put things. And there's so much you can do to improve the next painting you make that doesn't involve a hundred years of grinding until you, you know, can draw every muscle from memory and recite the names in Latin backwards and all of this kind of stuff. What matters is the final work you produce. And there's so much you can squeeze out of just being willing to make those decisions carefully. All right, so feeling pretty happy with how the block in is looking. I mean, all of these stages, they kind of blur together and it's not quite as simple as you finish one, then the next, but blah, 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 blah. Now I would say it's time to like refine these lines and get in there and start to tidy things up and make it ready for introducing some tone. So like if I were making a line drawing that was meant to be seen as a finished line drawing, there's all kinds of stuff you could do to make it beautiful and vary the line weight and you might have heard of some of this stuff. Um, and I'm really not doing any of that. This is not a aesthetic stage, it's purely functional and about creating something that helps us build towards the next step in my process. So you'll notice I'm working with the eraser a lot, I'm getting rid of any sketchy lines and committing myself to some drawings and some measurements and um, leaving a lot of clean paper because this is going to be a fully rendered drawing and all of that stuff is just kind of mess I'm going to have to clean up later. It also allows me to kind of hide any drawing mistakes, you know I've got like three, four lines, ooh maybe one of them's the right line. No, not here. This is a clean, boring looking thing, um, but it forces you to aim for a higher standard of drawing accuracy. If you have my particular flavor of mental illness where that's how you like to have fun. So yeah, I'm moving piece by piece. I'm allowing myself to give individual areas of the drawing lots more attention. Earlier on, I was kind of working everywhere, jumping around a lot. It's a bit more linear now, piece by piece. This is the phase of the drawing that I can find the most boring because you're putting in a lot of work and you're not really getting any results that are very exciting to look at. So put on some chill music, whatever you need, you know, create like a nice ambience and take your time because it does pay off so much further down the line to have done a good job here. I'm double checking anything that will give me a really bad day if I discover it's wrong two weeks from now. I don't want to figure out that her head's in the wrong place that the anatomy's wonky, that some of these heads are not in perspective properly. I'm really ignoring things like foliage, ripples, anything that's not tied to any specific structure and that I can just kind of solve in the rendering. I just pretty much leave it out for now because it's just gonna get in the way. A simple drawing requires less mental work to um, compare proportions with your reference. You know, if there's too many lines down there, it becomes a kind of 
spider web from hell that can be quite hard to look at, I find. But yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, just like, again, take your time here. It really, really pays off. And yes, if you notice my hair changing shorter, it's gonna get longer again in a minute. That's because this is my first time trying to make a video like this and I am currently in the middle of editing hell. It's a big learning curve. So if you do like this, you know, share it with your grandma, share it with a friend. Let me know down below, do all the YouTube things, like, comment, subscribe. I'm excited about doing this and it would mean a lot. You know, let me know what you wanna see, if you like it, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, back to the video. So a little further into my drawing process, you'll notice I'm starting to add flat tones. And this allows me to think about how the shadows will group together into larger masses, how darker materials will group together, like the darker material in her dress will group together with the shadows on the face. And I'm trying to visualize ahead of time those negative spaces of light that are gonna be left. Another reason I like to introduce flat tones in the drawing stage is it allows me to more clearly see the primary light shapes that will be against dark backgrounds. If you look at the side of her leg, which is gonna be in the light, her hair, which is gonna be backlit against the background, or the faces in the water, which are going to be lighter than the darker reflections behind them. When you draw a line, it's unclear whether that line is meant to represent the exact contour or if it's gonna eventually merge into the background, leaving only an edge. And by using flat tones, I'm able to start shaping that edge against the darker background more clearly. And I wanna make sure those shapes have an interesting uh, interplay between them. And I wanna make sure that they serve the focal point of this composition. When you create a piece of artwork like this, Absolutely everything on the page can be placed with intention, but nothing has to be there accidentally. And composition for me is the way in which you use different visual elements to emphasize the focal point and the purpose of this piece of artwork. So I like to use flat tones to make sure there's a nice balance between busy areas with lots of detail to get stuck into and nice empty areas to let those focal points shine. Okay, so now we have the figure and the faces on the water kind of blocked in, a very loose suggestion of the environment and scene she's in, and um, we have a little bit of tone for the shadows on the figure. I haven't bothered doing that in the background, and that's very specific to working in pencil, it's just so easy to smudge, so I kind of hold off on putting large blocks of tone down for as long as possible. If this were a painting, I definitely would have, you know, just slapped on a background tone because that's quite easy to work with. And from here on out, any semblance of a super logical, thoughtful process is just going to fall apart because now I just kind of want to start pushing areas in the direction of done. I never fully decide that anything is finished until I see it all together at the end. There's often a lot of last minute balancing or going back into areas, but we're gonna start putting down some real values now. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Let's start with the hands. Hands are just a pain in the ass and imagine how much we can lower anxiety coming back in day after day if I can just sit down tomorrow and think, yeah, that hand is fine, don't need to touch that again. So I have a three-part checklist that really helps me out moving into any complicated area. And so first of all, we're gonna separate light and shadow, and we're gonna make sure that those two areas of value are nice and separated, and there's no overlaps. So there'll be a really clean sense of light. Then we're gonna focus on the silhouette, make sure the silhouette reads well, and we're gonna put effort into the boundary line between light and shadow, the kind of specific shape created by the form and its angle relative to the light. And if you can get those three things right, you have done 80% of the work. The rest is just finishing touches. With the light and shadow separated, a clear shadow boundary and a clear silhouette, it's gonna read as whatever it's meant to read as. And the rest is all icing on the cake. You know, all those little gradients, half tones, soft edges, whatever. 
when you first look at a drawing, that first second that you're seeing it, if you're able to understand what you're looking at, you don't have time to take in all of that subtlety. And it's those three things that are doing 80% of the legwork. And in fact, a lot of loose painters and people who have like a sketchier style, you can get away with so much texture in the shadows, you can get away with a lot of noise. As long as those three things read pretty clearly, you're gonna understand what you're looking at. And next up, I felt like putting some dark values down on the dress. You'll notice I'm laying some pencil down and then using tissue paper, I'm kind of smudging it in to work that graphite into the grain of the paper. And then when I come in and layer another layer on top of that, any little gaps between my pencil strokes now have that gray value behind them. And you get a much smoother, darker looking tone than when those little gaps in the pencil are the white of the paper. And we have to build up to these dark values if we want them to be silky smooth and, and really kind of feel like a flat shadow that doesn't jump forwards with tons of texture and noise. And I've kind of chosen the dress because it's gonna define some of the darkest values I'm using in this drawing. And I like fairly early on in the rendering to be able to see the darkest values in my value range and the lightest ones close together to give me a sense of what kind of values I'm working with. A real beginner mistake with rendering is to render absolutely every area of your drawing with the full value range. That kind of can make everything look like it's made of chrome. People do too much reflected light, too much contrast within the lights, the values in the shadows not being dark enough. So when you have different materials like a dark dress, in some lighting scenarios, a dark piece of fabric in the light can be darker than a lighter material in your value range in the shadow. So I anticipate that say the shadow side of her leg and her face is gonna be significantly brighter than the shadows. And what's important to keep all of this feeling coherent is that each individual material still has a very clean separation between light and shadow. So you'll notice I don't start by darkening the dress in the light because then I'm gonna lose my shadow boundary and my shadow shapes that I've spent so much time finding. So I focus on the shadows first and once they're dark enough and smooth enough and looking good, I can start to knock down the value in the light later on in the process. And that's gonna really help make those materials feel separate. A general tip for the shadows is just to soften all of the edges and let things kind of merge together a little bit. If you have hard edges in your shadow, jumping forwards, they just don't convincingly read as shadows. If you have two shadows laying together, like try softening the edge between them and just losing the contour. Like eventually I know I'm gonna lose the contour between where she's sitting and the grass and her shadow. That's all gonna merge together into one continuous shape. And that really helps your lights to kind of jump forwards and properly catch the eye and prevent everything from becoming too busy and overworked. I really can't emphasize this enough, but the essence of making your light feel bright is to darken everything else. We cannot make the paper any lighter. I mean, we could use some white pen, I do that sometimes, but essentially once you've defined your upper limit to the values, the only way to make those values feel brighter is to darken everything else. It's not about the absolute value, but the relationship between those two things that creates a sense of light. And it's for the same reason why we don't wanna use any values in the shadows that appear in the lights, because then we just kind of lose that clear, radiant sense of light that I'm going for. All right. I'm back, you don't know I went anywhere, but I've been sick for a week. Um, hmm? What are you gonna do with that information? I don't know. Continuing. So I'm gonna begin working on the water now. Water is one of my favorite things to draw and it's so complicated. There's so many elements that go into how it's going to appear within your drawing. You need to think about what kind of body of water this is, what the surface of the water is like three-dimensionally. Is it choppy waves? Is it a still pond? Is it like a little glass of water, a bathtub? All of these things will affect the way any reflections are handled or how transparent the water appears. Yeah, you, there's so many variables. So I kind of start by blocking in her shape and then I start to loosely suggest some ripple patterns. And I have a bunch of photo reference, which I'll flash on the screen, of 
card was I took of a stream in a town I was living in like five years ago. And I really recommend getting into a habit of doing this if you ever see something just out there in the world that could be beautiful, could be part of a drawing. Just take a bunch of pictures. They don't, you know, it'd be great if you have a good camera, but as you'll see here, this is kind of just a low quality cell phone picture. And it's enough, you know, to inspire me about the kind of shapes I wanna make. I don't have the patience and I don't think it would turn out particularly well to go in and copy specific patterns out of this water, it would be so tedious. Um, instead, I just by having it on my laptop screen next to me as I'm drawing, it's kind of informing the kind of shape language that I'm going to use here. I'm going to start with all the values a little bit too light because, again, it's just easier to work with the graphite that way. And when I start to find shapes and patterns that work and there's a convincing sense of, um, you know, wateriness, then I'm going to slowly commit and build up the values. So areas like this can definitely just, they can be quite intimidating. It's complicated, detailed, there's, as I mentioned earlier, there's all these variables going on, but you kind of just have to start and then react to what you end up with. So I just try to avoid being overwhelmed by just diving in, trying a bunch of things. I can try different ways of handling the water in different areas. And when I feel like I'm discovering something that works, that's when I will commit and just, you know, I can fix, I can kind of bring it all together and make it work cohesively. And just, yeah, keep remembering, it's all about communication and communicating to the viewer clearly what this is. And that comes above strict realism in my list of priorities. So much of the time when you're working on something this complicated, it's so cheesy, but you, you gotta trust the process, man. You just kind of have to keep finding a way to put a foot in front of the other and moving forwards and just trusting that you can always come back, do something over again if it didn't work, you know, try to take, if something really isn't working, take a step back and figure out, um, is there a reference I could find? Is there a painting I can find that has handled a similar theme? Often you're kind of overcomplicating things if it's becoming a mess, like keep stepping back, look at your drawing from a distance and ask yourself, does it read clearly? Is what you're doing serving the composition? Is it communicating what you want it to communicate or is it becoming detail for its own sake that is just getting busy and taking away from the impact of the whole image because remember why we're doing this we had an original something we wanted to communicate some idea we wanted to illustrate we can get kind of lost in the technical source and you just always have to remind yourself if it's not helping communicate that idea just get rid of it or simplify it because it's taking away from this image. We're not trying to impress other artists, we're trying to sell this little imaginary world we're building and invite people in, and it should be effortless to understand what is happening in the picture, if that's what we want. Okay, I keep saying okay. I guess it is okay. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, it's time to really dig into the face now. So the first thing I notice is that as I've started to develop the values on the dress and see where my darks are gonna be keyed, the shadows have all began to feel too light and a little bit too much contrast within them. Lighting wise, I kind of have this strong sunlight source from picture right, from her left. And then I have a kind of subtle sense of some illuminated bounce light coming from kind of the bottom right within the shadow. And you know, we can imagine that's coming from, it could be bouncing off the ground near her, maybe it's just kind of brighter on that side, it doesn't really matter. There's a bunch of things that could make the light look that way. And it just adds a little bit of, a little bit of extra oomph into the shadows, right? It's fun to include this kind of secondary light source within the shadows, but the trick is to make sure that it doesn't take away from the strength of that primary light source. So as I come in and I start to darken planes like on the cheekbone or down the middle of the nose uh, or along the kind of shadow edge, I then need to do the second pass where I lightly, and now using much harder pencil leads, darken all of the reflected lights so that, that those um, those value differences are really nice and subtle and if you squint or step back they kind of merge together and don't um, yeah don't take away from the impact of the primary sunlight which needs to feel really bright to feel like sunlight and I've also noticed that the hair which is a darker material on this model than the skin 
needs to all be kind of grouped together. This little, you know, all of this light that's meant, these little hairs that are meant to be catching the light under her chin. They're way too close to some values within the shadow side of the hair. So all of that is being brought together. I noticed like also the ear was suffering from the same thing. It was too bright. So I've kind of knocked that down. Yeah, one of the main tricks for drawing features like eyes, nose, ears, whatever within the shadow is soften all the edges. If you have a reference, you'll notice that it's kind of vague in there and you can be specifically vague. You can copy the softness from those features within the shadow, but still be very specific about the shapes you make. I'm not just smudging it and hoping for the best. I'm going in and, you know, lightly, lightly softening edges and grouping things together. So it, it takes a lot of practice and life drawing and whatever to learn how to do this, where you can be um, very intentional about placing marks that are quite vague. I think I came in today and I knew that I wanted to tackle some foliage, some plants, some sort of decorative detail and establish the kind of place she's in. So I wanted to get into that. I wanted to get stuck into the weeds, literally, of this drawing. And um, they don't need to be taken to finish, but I just want to kind of get a sense of how I'm going to handle them. So as I work on these, uh, this is a good opportunity to talk about complicated, detailed areas like this. This drawing would be much harder for you to copy once it's finished than it was for me to draw it from scratch. Because as I drew things like these plants or any of the complicated texture, there's no particular finished state that I'm aiming for. So even though it's very detailed, as I'm drawing things like plants and these little intricate shapes, I'm not aiming for any specific set of shapes. I'm not drawing a reed and thinking, oh, I've put that in the wrong place. I'm just kind of going for an effect and I'll get what I get. And that speeds things up substantially. Some things are much harder to copy from a finished painting because you're aiming for these specific shapes they ended up with. Whereas for the artist, they were just like, blah, 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 here's some plants, you know, and you can't recreate that exact semi-random hand movement. So a lot of this detail may look quite overwhelming, but um, it's a lot easier to do on your own thing than it is to uh, copy. Does that make sense? So when you're working on complicated textures like this, clouds, reeds, drapery, things that can have a wide variety of forms, it's really easy to get lost in the texture and forget the basics of light and shadow. So it's important to think about still where your light source is coming from and eventually I'm gonna like lose a lot of this information. I'm gonna sort of try to give a general volume to all of these plants and I'll probably end up losing tons of what I'm putting in right now. But we kind of have to get something down and then go back and edit and simplify. Otherwise it ends up kind of lacking any teeth, lacking any interesting detail. And while I may be quite random with a lot of the shapes, I might pick like one reed that is kind of interestingly. There's a few shapes in there that I'll put a lot of intentional effort into just so that it has some design to it and something, yeah, more interesting to look at. It's really nice for different elements of your picture to overlap one another and really sell that sense of a three-dimensional space. You know, we're crafting that illusion that on this flat plane, there is actually depth. So a very simple way to do that here is I'm making sure some of these plants overlap her hand a little bit to really create that sense that her arm is going back in the picture and these plants are here in the foreground. And that's just something, a really simple trick to think about. It's very easy to draw all your picture elements separate and not interacting and just overlap things a little bit, bunch them together and make sure they kind of, yeah, overlap each other. It's a really quick way to just get a sense of depth. And that applies not just to the forms, but to shadows. If you have the, her cast shadow coming off of her, having that go behind the plants creates that sense of light, space, form. You know, we have her over here catching the light and she's casting a shadow and it's going behind the plants. Really simple way to just quickly s sell that illusion of a three-dimensional space. As I've added these plants into the drawing, it becomes necessary to kind of give them a reflection too. 
and I went back and forth on how complicated that would be. Would I have little lines of specific plants? And in the end, I felt like it served the picture better to just kind of go for quite a soft reflection. And I can maybe just on the edges of that hint at some detail of some plants. But again, it's something you could overthink and make really complicated, but to what end? And often stuff just works better if you go for the big, simple tonal features first and worry about the detail later on. The most important thing is just that we see this kind of dark stripe of reflection and it quickly creates that sense of light behind her. We're seeing the reflection of her arm and the plants and we get these nice streaks of light around that too. Again, yeah, just detail comes at the end. The stuff that people think is hard to do, the you know, little eyebrow hairs or the tiny hairs catching the light, that's the kind of stuff that is quite easy to spend some time at the end putting in and is actually relatively simple next to establishing the big overall tonal relationships that make the piece read correctly from a distance. So whenever we're doing small fine details in front of a dark background, you can't rely on the eraser to be able to pick that detail back out later on. If you want something to be bright in front of a dark background, you have to draw the negative spaces and so I try to sort of start with very loose lines and then I look for little diamond shapes and pockets of background between them and I kind of fill them in so that I'm left with the light shapes of the reeds. And I kind of start like that and then try to layer it. I try to then maybe draw little plants in some of those negative spaces and I just kind of build it up from there. I figured it was about time to put the background in up here. No particular reason, I just kind of wanted to see the lights come to life a little bit and hey, we gotta do it sometime. You'll notice I always have a white piece of paper under my drawing hand. I just have that kind of taped up top. It won't prevent all smudging, like if your hand is moving around a lot, it's definitely gonna, you know, you'll pick the paper up and you'll see some graphite on the back. But typically it, is going to be a hundred times better than if you weren't putting something under your hand. Wherever possible, if I'm working on an area of the drawing where I don't need to use the paper, I'm very conscious about how much weight I'm putting through my palm and I often try to have my hand off the paper and I hold my pencil quite far back like this so I have quite a lot of range with these small drawings. Um, on a larger piece you would use what's called a mall stick. You would hold something like this against the board and then you can just have your hand off the paper entirely. But I find a piece of paper does the job well enough. And uh, okay, backgrounds. So these smooth backgrounds in pencil may look like the simplest areas of the drawing, but they are one of the most labor intensive and difficult things to do because it is just very hard to get even gradients out of graphite. I have, I have just found that there is no simple, quick shortcut to the finish that I want. You can do things like graphite powder in a brush, or you can try to like smudge the whole thing in, but you always end up, the problem with lots of smudging is you end up with these soft changes in value that are actually, it becomes very difficult to see, to even know how to correct them. You end up with this kind of cloudy, soft effect that is going from lighter to darker, and because it doesn't have any hard edges or anything in it. It's uneven, but it's actually quite hard to even see how to even it out. First of all, you kind of have to have a plan of what you're gonna be doing with the background. So I know that it's gonna have a kind of general gradient as we move up to the right towards these kind of sunbeams coming through the picture. I want the values to go from darker to slightly lighter. I know that I want this little dark pocket in the top left corner, implying a kind of you know, maybe beam of light coming through the tree, which is gonna be implied on the right hand side. And I also want this sense of like atmosphere and dust or like forest goo, pollen, whatever in the air, so that we're actually seeing a kind of atmospheric shadow cutting through the air coming off of her head. Here what I do is like, I kind of, first of all, I'm trying to kill the white of the paper because if I'm working with graphite, you always pick up a bit of that paper texture and all those little gaps between the pencil lead you're seeing the white of the paper which creates a very noisy um, uneven look so my first pass is about lightly putting down some gray tones smudging them and just kind of diminishing the overall value to a really light gray 
And then I come in and I just have to slowly, with harder pencils, it's just kind of a slow process of evening out the tone and darkening the value and just staring into it like a madman, looking for tiny little patches that feel too light. Okay, I slightly, slightly darken them with the pencil. Oh, little blobs that are too dark. Maybe I come in with an eraser and pick them out. I'll often take my eraser like this and I'll create what I call the noodle. I just kind of stretch like a, can, can you see that? Yeah, like a bizarre finger of a razor that I can tickle the paper with. So you can just knock a little dust off. You can slowly even it out. And I pay extra attention around edges, right? I have this tricky edge where it's her dark shoulder against this gray background. And I don't want any weird artifacts of the pencil disrupting that edge and that overlap. You know, we want a smooth gray going behind a dark gray. And those kind of things are some of the hardest effects to achieve in pencil because you need to highly control two different tones and make sure that there's no weird bumpiness from the paper texture, that you don't exaggerate the contrast. And I mean, I wouldn't, I've never sat down with a piece of paper and just tried to make it smooth. That sounds really boring to me. This is just something over time, over having done hundreds and hundreds of these like long pencil projects. I just every single time try to push the finish a little bit better than I did the last time. And I look at my work from like five, six years ago and I can now see things that at the time I couldn't see or I was happy with that I know I could take a little further now. So it's not even something you can't aim for perfect in the next thing you do. Just every single time you use a medium, try to ask yourself if you can do it a little bit better than the last time. Try to find the last point where you gave up and see if you can challenge yourself to figure out how it could be better and how to push it in that direction. And then do that for years. And that's how you end up really pushing where you can get to with uh, in, in a technical sense with a medium. And then the challenging thing about making art is I have whole pieces I've made that I think were like a technical triumph for me, but I realized that the actual idea was boring or sucked. And you know, the crazy thing about trying to do this is it all has to come together to create something really special. Um, and the idea counts for so much more than the execution. Like a great idea that is Kind of, kind of sloppily done is so much more compelling to people. I don't think anyone else really cares as much as I do about like having a smooth tone in the background. Like, does it make a difference to the emotional or symbolic read of this image? Absolutely not. But this is just my, this is where I like to geek out. And it's just fun to have a thing like that. I, I really enjoy the process of challenging myself to, um, I mean, this is just dust on paper, you know? We're just putting graphite atoms on paper and we get to craft the illusion of space and form and light and create this little window into the imagination. And that process never stops being magical to me. And uh, I really do this for myself more than anyone else. It's, it's really a true love of the craft of it. Uh, but I don't know that I could justify, like justify the meaning of that beyond the meaning it gives me. Okay, this video is already getting pretty lengthy. So I think it's time for a kind of finishing montage. So as we're watching this little montage, I wanna talk a little bit about how to maintain patience through a drawing like this. So I'm gonna go on a little tangent here. I heard a word I like recently to distinguish between different kinds of activities that people do, which is t -lick and a t -lick coming from the word telos or like purpose. So an atelic activity is something that is purposeless, like going for a walk through the woods or, you know, dancing or uh, just sunbathing. You know, it's something that is done for its own sake and isn't done towards any kind of end. A telic activity would be something, something that you are doing for some kind of end to achieve something or to uh, attain something and drawing occupies this really difficult space somewhere between the two for me because we all talk about oh you gotta be in the moment you gotta you know, you know like if you create art 
we, I think most people aspire to reaching some version of it where it is an intrinsically enjoyable activity for its own sake. But as you're working on a drawing, you necessarily, if you're trying to take it somewhere or you're trying to finish it, there is a kind of destination to this activity. I am rendering it to have a finished drawing. And we live in a world and an ecosystem and an economy where as an artist there are real life pressures to finish work. Maybe you need to deliver for a client or maybe you just feel the kind of pressure of needing stuff for social media or needing to have work to sell or for a show. So the thing about drawing is it's very, very hard to enjoy it and to do your best work when you are stuck in the mindset of needing to be finished. And at the same time, there are very real reasons you need to be able to finish work. And so it's this delicate balance I have found that in order to satisfy the very real needs of me to produce new work, I have to get out of that mindset and learn to enjoy drawing in an atelic, intrinsically meaningful way. The only way I can finish something like this is if I allow myself to come in and really try and get in a mindset where I forget about everything else but the current problem in front of me with the drawing. If I'm working on some little plants here or a face over here or these patterns in the ripples, if I have an undercurrent in my head pushing me to try to be finished and worrying about how long it's taking, how much further there is, all of that is occupying crucial space that is needed to actually make the drawing good. So there's a kind of weird paradox where the only way to actually do this correctly is to try to forget about, forget about finishing, forget about social media, sales, your client, whatever. I need to create that space where it's just me in a kind of timeless way with this drawing. And that's where patience comes from. Um, I am not a naturally patient person. I struggle with my attention span in all kind of areas of my life, but I have kind of learned through trial and error and banging my head against the wall how to find that capacity within myself for making art. So my number one rule is never think about being done. Uh, being finished is something that just creeps up on me. If I set a deadline, or if I, um, you know, sit down one day and say, okay, maybe I can finish today, that is a way to guarantee that I have a pretty miserable time working on the drawing that day. So one thing I tell myself is, the only thing that's gonna happen when I finish this drawing is I'm gonna move on to another drawing. And if I can't learn to enjoy working on this drawing now, then I have really set up a miserable life for myself because when I finish this one, there's just gonna be another one. So I have to learn to enjoy the process of visual problem solving. Like drawing is an intrinsically hard activity. That brings a certain level of stress with it, but that's okay. There are all kinds of things we do that are stressful and difficult that we can learn to enjoy. I mean, in my free time, I play like, you know, I'll make myself play really difficult video games. And why, why do I enjoy that despite the fact that it's stressful and hard and that's because there is a part of you that can in that wants the challenge you know that finds that satisfying to have to find those capacities within yourself and to solve problems and to push yourself right so it's okay that it's hard it's okay that it's sometimes stressful i'm trying to find the part of me that is looking for something satisfying to get my teeth stuck into so yes, for a long project like this, I have to forget about being done. I have to, once I've planned everything and know that everything's in the right place, I have to partition my attention to small pieces of the drawing and treat them as individual challenges that have their own sense of completion so that at the end of the day, I can feel the satisfaction of having finished something, even if the overall drawing isn't finished. So I might pick a like two faces or I might pick some area of the water where I want to improve the ripples or I might pick, you know, name your thing, something on the drawing and I just focus in on that and I try to get into the joy of solving those problems. In a way, it's a kind of applied mindfulness 
the feeling of being impatient is really just certain types of thoughts and feelings arising in that moment on the drawing. Thoughts like, why is this taking so long? Why is this so difficult? I'm not going to be able to make this look good. Is anyone going to like this? Is this a waste of time? You know, those kind of thoughts, just learning how to kind of drop them and come back to the drawing and find there's something I say to myself when I'm feeling restless or bored, like if I'm find myself changing the music too much or looking for something interesting to listen to or, you know, seeking distraction, I try to remind myself that that alleviation to boredom that I want, I have to get that from the drawing and I can get that from the drawing by paying closer attention. If you really pay attention to the problems in this particular piece of the drawing, you can find a way to find them interesting and try to have that be the solution to your boredom. And I can't, I can't do this kind of work for eight to 10 hours a day, even when I wasn't on half days because of like parental leave. And you know, I was in the studio for eight hours. I may be doing my best concentrated drawing work for like four of them max. And then anyone else who works as a freelancer knows there's always like a couple of hours of like emails and admin stuff, or maybe I'll, if I have a few hours left in the day, I'll pick some area that is fairly mindless, like smoothing out the background or something that doesn't require my best focus. But in terms of my most concentrated solving difficult problems on the drawing, I really think there's only a certain amount of hours that I can hold the kind of like deep focus that that requires. And that's a, it's a very sensitive state and is very like if you get distracted or if you keep checking your phone or any of these kind of things, it can take, you know, 20, 30 minutes to get back to that place. So it becomes very important to really radically clear out the schedule for your drawing time. And, you know, it's simple hacks, like if you're going to listen to music, pick a long playlist and then just be OK with it. Don't don't believe the lie that there's like some better song that would just like radically improve the moment you're in. Yeah, you have to solve the boredom through paying closer attention to the drawing. And yes, and, and that's why, that is why it's so important for me to pick areas when it comes to the rendering and really, really finish them because I need that moment of stepping back and seeing some little piece of the drawing really working and that little mini victory is what carries me on to the next one. And like I said, I'm, I'm just not thinking about, am I nearly done? I let that surprise me. Almost always I'll just be working one day and suddenly look and go like, this thing might be finished. And then there's often, I sleep on it, uh, come back the next day, there's always a few things that, that I see after one more sleep. So it's a good idea to not finish at the end of a working session, because I think you can confuse getting bored with being done on that day. But yeah, just to repeat it, try to bear in mind what I said, okay? Like if you've ever felt the joy of drawing, it was probably in a moment that was low pressure, you weren't trying to be done, you were doing it for its own sake in a kind of atelic way, and you have to find ways to let yourself get back to that timeless, fully present moment with your artwork. Because everything else is delusion. All the things that you think you want from art, feedback from other people, work doing well online, things selling. Obviously, like, we need practically these things to happen sometimes as artists, but the satisfaction from them fades very, very quickly. And you're setting yourself up for a life of frustration if you can't find real intrinsic enjoyment in just making this stuff for its own sake. Otherwise, um, yeah, life rapidly begins to feel very empty if everything we do is driven towards different achievements which will all necessarily not be satisfying, or if they are satisfying, they won't be satisfying forever. So if you want to be an artist, what is the point in dedicating yourself towards such a difficult life to pull off if you don't find a way to love making art? But it's not meant to be stressful because you can find that. If you ever got interested in this in the first place, it's because you have that capacity. There's a part of you that loves to draw for its own simple pleasure. 
I mean, that's why we all got started doing this. It's why I think most kids love to draw. It's a really fun thing to do. And it's just so easy for the world to beat that out of you with all the constant pressure from outside. I'm not trying to dismiss that. And yes, if you're a working artist, you do have these real practical realities. And sometimes, you know, I do have to work on deadlines if I work with a client. But as much as possible, I don't want that in my head. And bizarrely, to actually win that game, I need to forget about it, if that makes any sense. And we're done. Congratulations if you made it this far in the video. Thank you, you know, let me know what you thought. I want to point out some details I was particularly happy with on this drawing. I really love these little plants chilling in the shade and the light cutting through the reeds. I like how the water looks. I think it has a nice kind of loopy, flowy quality. And overall, it honestly just felt good to make something after a year away on parental leave. It's always mixed emotions finishing a drawing. I put so much effort and time into them that I think I sometimes get a bit delusional about what kind of payoff there's gonna be. For there's no fanfare for finishing them. You just kind of look at what you have and and not every piece is gonna be your favorite. It's about a continuous process of creation being part of your life. And there are peaks and there are valleys, but it's important to just keep making the next thing. Thank you so much for watching. I will be uploading super infrequently. I have a really busy year now with a show to prepare for. This has taken so much time that I, I basically don't think I can record the rest of the pieces I have to make before my show realistically but think of this as a proof of concept yeah i want to make more hope you enjoyed it and until next time good luck with your own creative projects enjoy it try to enjoy the experience of making something for its own sake thank you and goodbye <laughs>